Page 27. Chapter 3. An Oxygen Tent and a Chocolate Milkshake. Days and nights blurred together. My parents came in, wearing hospital gowns, gloves, and masks. As they stood beside my bed, I saw fear in their eyes. I realized they were allowed into the isolation ward now, when they had not been earlier, because I was so sick that the doctors weren't sure if I would live. I was glad to have them there, though they were not allowed to touch me, and could stay only a few minutes. Always in the past, they had made everything all right for me. I felt safer knowing they were in the room. I still had a fever. I ached all over. My throat hurt, and I couldn't shift position in bed without help. Periodically, a nurse turned me from my side to my back, and later to the other side. That eased the pain temporarily, but it always came back. Page 28. We're going to put you in an oxygen tent, the doctor said. It was the same doctor who had told me about bulbar polio. Was it the same day? The same week? I didn't know if I had slept five minutes or a month. We hope the oxygen will keep you breathing on your own, he continued. If not, a respirator will help you. I looked where he pointed, and a wave of horror poured over me. As I realized, respirator was another name for what was popularly called an iron lung. I'd seen pictures of people in iron lungs. The tube-shaped machine completely enclosed the patient's body. Only the head stuck out. Bellows pumped air in and out, causing the patient's lungs to expand and contract. Small doors and portholes on the sides of the iron lung allowed the nurses to put their hands in to bathe the patients and help with toileting. Portions of the doors were clear plastic so the nurses could see what they were doing. Some patients stayed in iron lungs for the rest of their lives, never again breathing by themselves. I thought it would be like being put in a coffin while you were still alive. Page 29. Now an iron lung loomed beside my bed, hoses hanging like tentacles, a gray octopus ready to swallow me at any moment. As I imagined my future with an iron lung, tears of despair rolled down my cheeks. I could not raise my hand to wipe them away, and they ran into my eyes. Until I got polio, I had led a carefree life. My brother Art is six years older than I. My parents had longed for a baby girl, and my birth was cause for celebration. Throughout my childhood, I was dearly loved, and I knew it. My earliest memories are of swinging, with lilacs in bloom on both sides of my swing, flying high past the purple blossoms, surrounded by the scent, of pushing Raggedy Ann, Raggedy Ann and Marilyn, my favorite dolls, in my doll buggy, of sitting on a picnic bench with my mother's relatives around me, all of them singing, Sleep, Kentucky Babe, or You Are My Sunshine. Nothing in these experiences had prepared me for the words, the patient is paralyzed from the neck down, or the sight of an iron lung standing beside my hospital bed. The oxygen tent was a sheet of plastic that was draped over me from my waist to the back of my head. Page 30. Inside the plastic, oxygen was released for me to breathe. A frame kept the plastic three feet above my head and chest while the four sides hung down to touch my bed. Looking through it was like viewing the room through a foggy windshield. My parents brought me a teddy bear from Art, who was a freshman at Carleton College. They put the little bear inside the oxygen tent. This oxygen tent is just what you need, Mother said, her cheerfulness sounding forced. It will make it easier to breathe, and you'll soon feel better. The extra oxygen did ease my breathing, but nothing helped the fever and pain. Once in the middle of the night, I awoke, aching all over. I badly wanted to roll onto my other side. Nurse, I yelled as loudly as I could. Nurse, the night nurse rushed into my room. I need to be turned, I said. What? She said it as if she had never heard of anything so outrageous. 
I need to be turned, I repeated. No, you don't. She stood beside my bed, hands on her hips, and glared at me. Page 31. She was a large woman, and seen through the oxygen tent, she looked even bigger. I just turned you not ten minutes ago, she scolded. I'm not turning you again already. You'll get turned every thirty minutes, the same as every other patient in this ward. But my legs hurt. They're going to hurt no matter how many times I roll you around, so you might as well get used to it. My back hurts, too. I want to lie on my other side. Years of prodding by my mother surfaced. I added the magic word. Please? I'm too busy to run in here just to turn you in that bed. She shook a finger at me. Don't you call me again unless it's an emergency. You hear me? Do not call me unless you can't breathe. My legs throbbed, my arms ached, my back, neck, and throat hurt. I lay there helpless, staring at her. She could have turned me in the time it took to tell me no, I thought, and how was I supposed to call for help if I couldn't breathe? At that moment, I wanted to go home more than I had ever wanted anything. But along with the river of homesickness that flowed through my veins came a trickle of indignation. Page 32. I was angry at her and angry at my disease. I am not, I decided, going to lie here and be helpless for the rest of my life. I'm going to fight. I squinted at the nurse through the plastic oxygen tent. Some day, I vowed, she'll be sorry. I'll fight this polio and I'll beat it. I'll walk out of here and I'll tell the whole world about the mean nurse who would not help a paralyzed child turn over in bed. When my parents visited the next day, I told them about the nurse who refused to turn me. They were furious. I don't know what they said or to whom, but that night I had a different nurse. The one who wouldn't turn me was never my nurse again. During those first days in the hospital, I ate almost nothing. Even if food had sounded good, which it didn't, it was now increasingly difficult to swallow. My throat felt swollen shut and its muscles didn't want to work. All my life, I had swallowed without any conscious thought. Now I had to think about every step of the process and force my throat muscles to perform what used to be a simple act. It was hard to swallow my own saliva. Food was more than I could manage. Page 33. Because of my fever, it was important for me to drink lots of liquid. I tried to drink some ice water each time my parents and the nurses held the glass for me. I was also given apple juice, grape juice, and 7-Up, but they were no easier to swallow than water. I was not offered milk, even though I drank milk at home. Because milk creates phlegm, or mucus, in the throat, patients with bulbar polio were not allowed any milk or ice cream for fear it would make them choke. One evening, a particular, particularly patient nurse coaxed me to drink some 7-Up. She put one hand behind my head and lifted it gently to make it easier for me to swallow. Just take a little sip, she said. I wanted to drink the 7-Up to please her, and because I was thirsty, I sucked a mouthful through the straw. But when I tried to swallow, my throat didn't work, and all the 7-Up came out my nose. As the fizzy liquid stung the inside of my nose, I sputtered and choked. The choking made it hard to get my breath, and that frightened me. If I couldn't breathe, I would be put in the iron lung. After that, I didn't want to drink. I was afraid it would come out my nose again. I was afraid of choking. Page 34 Only the constant urging of my parents and the nurses got enough fluids into me. Eight days after my polio was diagnosed, my fever still stayed at 102 degrees. My breathing was shallow. The painful muscle spasms continued, and every inch of my body hurt. It was like having a bad case of the flu that never ended. My only bits of pleasure in the long hours of pain were the brief visits from my parents and looking at the little teddy bear that Art had sent. On the afternoon of the eighth day, Mother said, We can't go on like this. You need more nourishment. You'll never get well if you don't swallow something besides water and juice. 
Isn't there anything that sounds good? Think hard. If you could have anything you wanted to eat or drink, what would it be? A chocolate milkshake, I said. No milk, my chart stated. No ice cream. Mother told a nurse, Peg would like a chocolate milkshake. We can't let her have a milkshake, the nurse replied. I'm sorry. She needs nourishment, Mother declared, especially liquid. She thinks she can drink a milkshake. Page 35. She could choke on it, the nurse said. It's absolutely against the doctor's orders. She left the room muttering about interfering parents. You rest for a bit, Mother told me. We'll be back soon. She and Dab went out. They returned in less than an hour, carrying a white paper bag. The nurse followed them into my room. I won't be responsible for this, she said, as she watched Dad take a milkshake container out of the bag. Milk and ice cream are the worst things you could give her. Dad took the lid off the container while Mother unwrapped a paper straw. We know you have to follow the rules, Dad said, but we don't. This is our daughter, and she's had nothing to eat for over a week. If a chocolate milkshake is what she wants, and she thinks she can drink it, then a chocolate milkshake is what she is going to have. He handed the milkshake to Mother, who put the straw in it. What if she chokes to death, the nurse demanded. How are you going to feel if you lose her because of a milkshake? Page 36. If something doesn't change soon, Dad replied, we're going to lose her anyway. At least this way we'll know we tried everything we could. Mother thrust the milkshake under the oxygen tent and guided the straw between my lips. I sucked the cold, thick chocolate shake into my mouth, held it there for a second, and swallowed. It slipped smoothly down my throat. For the first time since I got sick, something tasted good. I took another mouthful and swallowed it. I had to work at swallowing, but the milkshake went down. The next mouthful went down, too, and the one after that. I drank the whole milkshake and never choked once, even though I was lying flat on my back the whole time. When I made a loud slurping sound with my straw, because the container was empty, my parents clapped and cheered. The released nur relieved nurse cheered with them. Within an hour, my temperature dropped. That chocolate milkshake may have saved my life.